Hey man, hey, how's everybody doing? God bless. You. Since I made a video, apologize about that. But anyway, uh, so what I want to do with this video is I I see there's a lot of confusion about baptism out there. So I want to keep it short. I hope that I can, but I definitely don't, I don't want to sacrifice being thorough. So um, so anyway, let's get into it. I'm going to try and just do a fairly fairly comprehensive. Uh, picture of what is what is why did God bring baptism? We don't really see that in the Old Testament. What what's the deal with that? What you know, it's like John the Baptist just starts baptizing people. Why? I mean, what's that about? And and then of course Jesus gives the command in the Great Commission before he leaves planet Earth to sit at the right hand of the Father, like Psalms one ten said that he would, and he'd stay there until he come back the second time. Um, before he left, the instructions were go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. And teaching them everything I've commanded you. That's in Matthew 28, you know, 18 to 20. So what's the deal with baptism? I mean, many people claim that it's just a public profession. Um, it's not really in the scriptures, but it's, uh, I think if you keep, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard this saying before, but, uh, and I hope I don't step on any toes out there. I hope people just listen and watch this video. We're going to go thoroughly through the scriptures, thoroughly through the scriptures, thoroughly. I encourage you. Watch and see. Watch and see. Um, we're going to go through the scriptures. But um, if you've ever heard the saying before, if somebody keeps telling a lie long enough, uh, long enough, let's say through generations, like not just like, you know, a couple of weeks. We're talking about for so many years that it actually becomes like you died and then, you know, you heard the same thing growing up and then their descendants heard it, whatever. If somebody tells a lie long enough, it becomes really believable to people regardless of whether it really is in the Bible or not. And so a uh, really popular saying is to say baptism is just a public profession. And, and the, you know, off the top of my head, one thing that is just should make somebody stop in their tracks is when you're going through the book of Acts, and I don't know how well you know the book of Acts, I encourage you to learn the book of Acts. Go through it again and again and again and again. Just park on it for a while. Don't go off and, hey, I got my uh, spiritual vitamin of the day, and I'm going to go read this writing and this writing written. No, stay in the book of Acts. Start from chapter one and just keep reading through it. Go back and read it again. And just, I just encourage you. It's really important. Just as the same thing with the Gospels. Do the same thing with Matthew. Do the same thing with Mark, Luke, um, and John. Really important to know those five books as a basis to try and understand the rest of the, the writings in the New Testament. The other uh, 22 books are all epistles. Um, you know, we'll call Revelation an epistle. I mean, I know it's an apocalyptic book, but um, but yeah, I mean, they're all written to Christians, right? Uh, but Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and Acts are a little bit different than that, you know, and so... You know, I've talked about that in other videos and stuff. But anyway, point being is really important. So uh, so counter to that argument that it's public profession, if you look at Acts chapter 16, if that was true, uh, then why when uh, the Philippian jailer, you know, is getting baptized because, you know, uh, some of the apostles there, you know, they get freed out of jail and the Philippian jailer is like about ready to kill himself because he knows he's going to be in big trouble with, you know, with the uh, uh, Roman government and everything uh, for these guys that thinking, you know, he thought that they escaped. And so, you know, Paul said, whoa, 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 no, wait a minute, don't, don't, don't harm yourself. And so anyway, all that to um, say that, you know, after Philippian jailer is like, you know, man, what do I have to do to be saved? And, you know, and they, and they talk to him. He ends up, him and his family end up becoming baptized. Now it says that they were baptized, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use my own words, but I encourage you to go look at the words in the scripture and see that it's conveying the idea of at the wee hours of the morning. Like it was probably like one or two in the morning or something. It it, it was at night. It was like early morning, night, whatever. Whether it was midnight, eleven o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, whatever, it is not a waiting until we can gather a big public profession gathering so that he can make his profession, whatever. That's no, that's not what happened. And so you got to ask yourself, this is what the apostles are doing. Why, why would they do that? Even in Philippians, or we're going to look at, um, not Philippians, sorry, um, Acts chapter eight. We're going to look at that just in a second. And you'll see what the um, Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, um, that's where I got though, you know, I started to say Philippians and Philip, baptizes him it's just the two of them in the chariot i mean he could have said well wait a minute we got to go get a gathering together so you can make a public profession no that's not what happened 
So this whole public profession thing is just, it's, it's basisless. It's not in the scriptures. It's something that it's not, it's anyway, let's go to the scriptures. I don't want to step on any toes, but anyway, let's look at the scriptures. So I'm just hoping that somebody will just read the scriptures. Let's follow me here. We're going to look at the scriptures and we're going to look at a lot of them. As you can see, I'm sure you can see my whole screen. See all these tabs up here. We'll look at a lot of scriptures. Uh, to see what, what is going on here. So starting with uh, Acts chapter 8, uh, we see um, this account with Philippians, you know, where, <laughs> I keep saying Philippians, where Philip was sent by the Holy Spirit to go um, and he sees this Ethiopian eunuch in the, in the chariot and he tells him, go, you know, right here in chapter 20, or it's chapter 8, verse 29. Uh, the Spirit tells Philip, go near and overtake his chariot. Um, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah, read the book of Isaiah. Now keep in mind, nobody had personal copies of the scriptures back then, right? It's just nobody had Bibles like we have. The printing press was invented in the 1500s. Praise God, we're able to since then have personal copies of the Bible. Prior to that, no one in history ever had personal copies of the Bible. Um, it was very difficult for hand copies. That's what the word manuscript means, you know, menu, you know, from Latin meaning hand. Um, manuscript means, and so they didn't have personal copies of the Bible. So here's Isaiah, who is, you know, uh, obviously a, a court official of some sort for the queen in Ethiopia. And, you know, he's, he's a eunuch and he's working for the government. And so he's got some, he's got some wealth. I mean, uh, you know, evidenced by the fact that he had, a, he was in a chariot, right? So he has a copy of Isaiah, right? So it says right here, we know to be um, somewhere along the way, somebody made the Bible into chapters and verses. We would call it Isaiah 53, chapter 53. And so they says right there, he starts reading from there and they're looking at Isaiah. And then after reading Isaiah, um, you know, he starts going into chapter 53 about the whole, you know, uh, lamb sacrifice of Christ, who is our Passover lamb, you know, the Passover sacrifice established in Exodus chapter 12. Um, and then as they're going through Isaiah, that's what they have. Is it possible they could have had other scrolls, other Old Testament books? It's possible, but it's pretty likely they probably just had Isaiah. Um, many early Christians, I, I can think of two of them off the top of my head. Um, Irenaeus, who around 180, who was a disciple of a man, Polycarp, who died as a martyr around 157. Irenaeus wrote around 180. We got two writings from him. And then, uh, you know, Polycarp was a disciple of the Apostle John. So Irenaeus is only two generations removed from the Apostle. Apostle John. And so Irenaeus says this, Justin Martyr, around 150, who was uh, alive when uh, Polycarp was alive. So he, you know, and they believe that he became a Christian around 130. So he probably encountered people like Polycarp. They were direct disciples of the apostles. The last apostle John died around 100 AD, according to church history. So anyway, all that to say, both these guys, Justin Martyr and Irenaeus, um, used um, Isaiah chapter 1, we're going to look at that, Isaiah chapter 1, uh, to show that this prophecy is actually a prophecy about baptism. So here, let's look at what the scripture says. And you can, I encourage you to go go look at it in context um, and get a greater, uh, you know, circumference or whatever of, of the scriptures. But I'm just going to jump in right here where we're seeing, you know, God kind of upset with the Israelites and with, you know, with the tribe of Judah, which, which was the southern kingdom. Um, and then Israel, which was the other 10 tribes, which is the northern kingdom. And Isaiah is preaching to all of them, and he's pretty upset with them. God is. So he tells them, to, he's calling them to repentance. Here's what repentance looks like. Put away the evil of your doings from my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. That's repentance. And then he says, wash yourself. Make yourself clean. So if we look at Acts chapter, where did I put that passage? Uh, yeah, I think it's right here. Yep. So if we look right here, repent and be baptized. This is what is ushered in day one of the church. Repent, cease to do evil, learn to do good, put away all your evil doings, and be baptized in the water. You know? And so both Irenaeus and Justin Martyr are quoting um, this writing, um, you know, Isaiah chapter 1, um, or, and even uh, other passages. Um, but yeah, he quotes, quotes this passage to refer to baptism. So that's my point. And so even here, look at this, this is baptism. Come now, let's reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. So here we got a picture of blood. 
And here we got a picture of, uh, you know, basically a washing away. And so we got it in First John chapter 5, verse 7. John says, these three are one, water, blood, and spirit, right? Water, blood, and spirit. We have in uh, Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. I'm not going to go there, but Isaiah, or I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 9 and 10. Uh, we have in there where it's describing, the writer is describing the ordinance that was established by Moses. God was prefiguring and showing a picture of where Moses was sprinkling the bloods, you know, just, you know, just like Jesus taking a whip in the temple. Jesus was, or Moses was sprinkling the blood and it says that nothing was purified, made holy apart from being sprinkled with that blood. And, and he says, likewise, because that was a foreshadowing, he said nothing. Without sprinkling of blood, without blood, there is no release of sins. Now, they translate it as forgiveness, but it literally means release, release of sins, right? And so um, this whole idea here, repent and be baptized, uh, you know, in the name of Jesus Christ for the, for the remission, the release of sins. That's what that means. Um, Afienai is the uh, infinitive. Um, and it means to release, release the sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So here we've got water. We've got spirit, and the blood is the remission of sins, the release that happens through the sprinkling of the blood. And we know that it's the blood of Jesus that saves us because it's the sprinkling of the blood that's on our souls, on our hearts. Um, and so even in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul is rebuking them, saying in verse 9 to 12, don't you know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And he starts going through all these sins, you know, sexual morality, you know, adultery, hatred, discord, I mean, all these things. Um, and he says, these will not, I warn you as I did before, those, those that live this way will not inherit the kingdom of God, um, which is very similar to Galatians 5, 19 to 21. And he says, but you were washed, you were justified, you were sanctified. This means made holy. So these are the three things. Washed, Acts 22, verse 16. When Paul was converted, he's sharing his conversion story. I encourage you to look at that if you're not familiar with it. He, uh, Ananias, who baptized him, says, now, Saul, what are you waiting for? Because, you know, before he was renamed Paul, he was called Saul. What are you waiting for? Get up and, and be baptized, washing your sins away, calling on the name of the Lord, calling on his name, right? So when are we calling on the name of the Lord, as Romans chapter 10 says? At baptism. And it's having our sins washed away. So you were washed. You were justified, sanctified. We're going to look closer at what Romans talks about being justified. What it means to be justified by faith. Because there's a word in um, Romans chapter 6, verse 7. It's very sloppily translated in all these Bibles, including King James. And they translate it as being freed. I'm going to show you by lots of examples in the book of Romans. How that word, dikaio, which is the verb, is translated all the time as justified or made righteous, one or the other. And yet in this one passage, and I think they do it because of their theology, they're trying to protect their pet doctrine, and they translate it as being freed. Whoever has died, that's what the passage says, Romans 6, verse 7, whoever has died has been set free from sin. And so it's not set free from sin. We're going to look at that in a second. It's being justified from sin. So I'm going to show you that in the Greek. But first, we're going to look at the English translation, and we're going to look at the Greek, and I'm going to prove it to you. Okay, so, so that's what Paul's talking about. But wash, wash your sins away. It's not like we can wash our sins away. Jesus does it. This has everything to do with why the early church in the period of the 100s understood, like Irenaeus would des describe, he's a second-generation disciple of the apostle John. He's going to have a lot more on straight than we would 2,000 years later. It's ridiculous to think that somebody that was only two generations removed from the Apostle John, who his teacher, Polycarp, who died as a martyr for Christ, was a disciple, a direct disciple of the Apostle John, that Irenaeus, who studied under Polycarp, who taught that, you know, um, you know, basically what I'm saying, I totally lost my train of thought there. But uh, anyway, let me get that train back on track here in a second. But anyway, just that whole idea of, um, you know, baptism, you know, and it's salvific um, uh, sort of thing that goes on here, that washing, justified, sanctified, this is talking about baptism, washing your sins away. So that's the way Aaron S. understood it. So he would explain it. So anyway, let's let's get into it here. So uh, moving on, we're going to start with um, why did God send, you know, John the Baptist? Okay, we're already almost 15 minutes in the video. Let me get moving here. Um, why did he send him? Okay, so that was prophesied in Malachi. It was prophesied in Isaiah that God would send somebody that would be like the spirit of Elijah in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way, like laying out the red carpet for the Messiah to come, the God-man, the word that became flesh, for him to come, the Messiah, which in Greek is Christ, Christos, Christ. 
He's the anointed one. So he's the man anointed with the spirit of God, the word that became flesh. Um, that's, you know, that's the whole idea. Word that became flesh, the spirit of God being, you know, which is anointing. Christos means anointing. Mashiach in Hebrew, which we bring into English as Messiah, is anointing. So it's it's uh, flesh being anointed with God, with the spirit of God, by the God man who is the Christ. And that's what Christ, the whole idea of Christ is about, is the God man. He's the bridge between humanity that is, you know, fallen by sinning and, you know, and separated from God, and he's the bridge to bring us to God. And so everything about Christ, um, I think it's oversimplified in modern Christianity, way oversimplified. There's a lot going on with what God is doing, and he, and he requires that we pay attention and not reject the truth, who is Christ. So John uh, 14, 6, I am the truth, he says. So, um, so anyway, in Luke chapter 1, we see here Luke chapter 1, New King James, that's what we're using. Um, this is what Zechariah, who his son was John the Baptist, he's prophesying over him. And he says a lot of stuff in there. You feel free to go look at it all. But right here, pay attention to what he's saying. And you, my child, John the Baptist, will be called the prophet of the highest, of the most high. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his way. That's what Isaiah, that's what Malachi was saying. He would prepare the way of the Lord um, to give knowledge of salvation to his people. Knowledge of salvation. Now, keep in mind, Yahweh is basically Yahweh saves or, you know, basically the idea, Yeshua, excuse me, Yeshua, the you know, translated into, uh, you know, into Greek, Jesus, which brought into English is Jesus. So, you know, Yeshua is Yahweh saves. So the knowledge of Jesus, the knowledge of salvation to his people by the release of their sins, as we talked about, the release of their sins. And so the washing away of their sins. And like John says, you know, I baptize you with water, but he baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so uh, so the baptism of Jesus is not just limited to what John did, but it's that and more. Because right here, to give them the knowledge, you will go before the face of the Lord, prepare the way for, for the Lord, for Jesus, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, remission of sins. And so what did what did John do? What did, was it just some insignificant sort of thing that so many people make baptism so so insignificant? It was so insignificant what Elijah or excuse me what John the Baptist did. Yet Jesus says that uh, um, John the Baptist was the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. Now, if baptism is so insignificant, why would Jesus say that? Now, certainly there's a lot to John the Baptist, but what I'm saying, if his whole mission was to call people to repent and be baptized, that's what we saw in Acts chapter two. Repent and be baptized. That was what happened on day one of the church. So if that mission is so insignificant, I mean, the whole purpose of the preparation for him was to show them knowledge of salvation and to give knowledge of salvation to his people and remission of their sins. And that's what John did. He said, John came, this Mark chapter one, John came baptized in the wilderness and preaching baptism and repentance, giving them knowledge of salvation for the remission of sins, right? Um, that's That's what we saw right here knowledge of salvation, remission of sins. And so we see that's repentance and, you know, being baptized, right? And they were confessing their sins. Now, I didn't plan to go into this, so I'm just going to try to do this really quickly. But I just want to show you some scriptures in the book of Acts. Book of Acts is the only book we have, the only book we have that shows the apostles preaching to non-Christians. So real quick, I want to show you some passages that maybe will wake you up to the like, importance of repentance. Right. So we're going to look at Acts chapter three. This is the beginning. The beginning of the church was Acts chapter one and two. I encourage you to go read it. If you're not familiar with Acts, you got to get familiar with Acts. It's so important. Um, so right here, Acts chapter 19, Peter is preaching. He says, repent, therefore be converted. Um, that the Greek actually means anointed out or, or excuse me. I'm sorry. I'll get to that in a second. I blotted out. Sorry, right here. Um, converted, meaning they turn back or that you turn. Um, repent, therefore, and turn, that your sins may be uh, um, uh, anointed out, ex alifo, alif actually, um, so to be anointed out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may, may send Jesus Christ, Because right, like Romans chapter 8, verse 9 and 10, whoever doesn't have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him, so he may send the Spirit of Christ to you, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration. Because again, he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. And, you know, we said that already. Um, and God has spoken the, um, about him by the mouth of all the holy prophets. 
Verse 26, right here, check this out. And to you first, God, to the Jews first, and then later the Gentiles. To you first, God, having raised up servant, his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you. How, is, how are you blessed? In turning away everyone. Every one of you from your iniquities or your wicked ways. You know, probably a clearer understanding is wicked ways or iniquities. In turning every one of you. That's the blessing. Turning every one of you away from the wicked ways. So the knowledge of salvation is turning every one of you from the wicked ways, which is um, repentance. And that's what we saw in Isaiah. Come now. Let's reason together. Um, wash yourself. Make yourself clean. Put away the evil of your doings before my eyes. Cease to do evil and learn to do good. Um, this whole garbage about righteousness is filthy rags. I'm not going to get into that here. I've got a video on that, but that is really a wicked teaching. It started with Martin Luther in the 1500s. And it's so like yeast in the dough. It's so pervasive throughout planet Earth. And I pray that people wake up and see that. So I encourage you to go look at my video on that. On uh, Is our righteousness as filthy rags to God? Because we walk through from like chapter one of Isaiah and we see context before you get to the end. Because where he makes that quote, it's never quoted in the New Testament, that passage. Um, Isaiah 64, chapter 64. There's 66 chapters in Isaiah. We walk through from the beginning and we skip through it like lily pad, like a frog, through Isaiah to see by context how God feels about righteousness. And does he see it as filthy rags? And is that taken out of context? I encourage you to go check out that video. So we're not going to get in that here. But anyway, after John was doing this mission, here's the contrast between the people and we see the impact spiritually with them. Those that were baptized and submitted to their, you know, to repent, and confess their sins with John. Again, being shown the knowledge of salvation, as we saw I, um, Zechariah, his father, prophesied. So when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized. See, they were baptized by God. And they were justified by God because they were baptized by the baptism of John. And the Pharisees and, and lawyers, or the teachers of the law, really, I think is a better uh, rendering, rejected the will of God for themselves. They rejected the will of God for themselves. They weren't baptized. They rejected John, um, not having been baptized by him. They weren't baptized by John. So um, let's keep moving. I want to show you real quick here a few quotes from the early church. I had mentioned Irenaeus. Um, here's something Irenaeus says. Now, this is around 180. Check this out. This class of men, he's referring to the heretics in his writing, um, having instigated by Satan to a denial of the baptism, which is regeneration to God, and thus a renunciation of the whole Christian faith. Right. This is the narrow road. This is how you get into Christ. And I'm going to show you that. We're going to keep looking at scriptures. Um, I want to show you so many scriptures that you just convinced. But if you turn the video off, I can't help you. I encourage you. If you disagree, this this is so important. I encourage you. I respectfully challenge you. I beg you. Please keep watching the video. We're going to look at a lot of scriptures. Hang in there. Um, I can show you more video or more uh, passages, but you can go look this up if you want. Earlychristiandictionary.com. Um, poke around, look at the different things. You know, they're all alphabetized, but look up baptism. Look at a lot of these passages, early Christian quotes on baptism. And then I encourage you, go in the anti nicene Fathers in Google and look for these writings. Like this particular writing with Irenaeus, this would be a writing called Against Heresies. It would be in volume one of the anti nicene Fathers, as it says here. Um, the pages depend on that would be if you had the hard copy, these pages would be correct. Um, and I don't even know if they republished it or this would be the first publishing or whatever. Um, but don't go by the page number so much. Go by volume one and then just Google this like for this quote and you'll find it. So and you can do that for all these and stuff. So um, so let's get into this here. What do we got? Galatians chapter three. I guess let's see that should go down here. Um Oh, actually, take that back. Let's do that here. And let me bring Galatians down here. So first, we'll look at it in English. So uh, real quick, nice overview. I'm going to go into this more. But um, just for baptism in general, just think about it. Um, God is going to destroy the earth. Second Peter chapter 3 says he's going to destroy the earth with fire. He baptized the earth the first time with water, and he destroyed it all living things except for the only righteous man and family that existed and stuff. So, um, uh, it, but he's going to do it in the end because he said he would never, he did it with the rainbow. He said, I'll never do that again, but he's going to do it with fire. Right. And that's how he's going to like sanctify the earth. So that you know, the new earth that Jesus talks about Matthew chapter five, you know, the, the meek or the gentle, 
the word actually means gentle, praos in Greek, um, will inherit the earth. Um, so it's a big call to repent of anger towards human beings, those made in the image of God that Jesus died for, and become gentle and stuff. And don't let Satan uh, kid you and lie to you to think, no, 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 that's womanly. No, 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 men aren't supposed to be gentle. Jesus was gentle. The scriptures say Jesus was the most gentle. Um, he said, learn from me. He said, he's gentle. That's what he says. Learn from me. Take my yoke upon you. He said, he's gentle and humble in heart. Um, but he said, the, the, the gentle, Matthew chapter 5, the gentle will inherit the earth. They translate that as meek, but I think a lot of people don't really know what meek means. I know for a long time I thought meek meant humble, and certainly gentleness points to humility, but that's not what it means. So anyway, um, get back on point here. Fire will destroy the earth um, in the end. Um, you know, God will use it to destroy the earth due to our sin, the earth of, or the sin of human beings. Just like because the people sin, um, the earth with the people, um, lots of people, was destroyed by water in the beginning. And so, um, and we could get into First Peter 3, and we certainly will, in verse uh, 20. Uh, you know, Paul or uh, Peter starts using that to show that in the beginning, um, Noah was saved. The people were destroyed. The sinners were destroyed, but the righteous was saved through water. And he says the same thing here. Water is used by God to save the world and due to his righteousness, due to righteousness of Christ. Right. And so he makes us righteous and then he teaches us to be righteous. And we'll get into that more later on. This video is not so much about that, how Christ actually makes us righteous. It's not through imputed righteousness. It's actually by actually obeying Jesus. And we'll get into that some other time and stuff. So Romans chapter six, if you want to read that whole chapter. I mean, it talks so much about it. It's by becoming slaves of God or servants of God, slaves of God. Uh, formerly been slaves of Satan and unrighteousness and sin. Now we make ourselves slaves of, of Christ voluntarily. And by doing that, we're being sanctified or made holy and stuff. That's what Romans chapter 6 teaches. Well, um, we'll get into that in other videos. Um, I think I've maybe done a video on that already. But anyway, let's continue on. So see the anti-types here, fire and water. Fire to destroy, water to save. Okay. Um, let's keep seeing Let's keep digging the scriptures, see if that's what the scriptures say. Okay, so Colossians chapter 2, we're going to look at. We're going to look at Galatians 3 right now. Clothing yourself with Jesus, with Christ. What is that about? Romans chapter 6. So we'll look at Colossians 2, Galatians 3, Romans 6. Let's start off with Galatians 3, which is clothing yourself with Christ. What does Paul say? He's talking about um, a whole lot about not going back to the Mosaic law here. He says we're justified by faith. We're going to take a look at this. I mentioned already Romans chapter 6. Because uh, it starts out mentioned in Romans chapter 3, justified by faith. And then we're going to see in Romans 6 how that actually happens when we unpack that, how that happens through death. We have to die. And, and we're going to see Romans chapter 6, verse 7, that whoever dies is justified from sin. That's how by faith, because we don't really die. We do it by faith, by participating in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And we're going to look at that in a second. That's what Romans chapter 6, 1 through 6 says. But anyway, um, it says here, Therefore, the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ, um, that we might be justified by faith. Um, but after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, right, which was the law. Uh, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ. Who's he saying? All you. You who? Uh, who's, who's the you he's talking about? And that's you plural, by the way, in Greek. It's not you singular. Uh, for as many of you as were baptized, not not in other words, if you were to draw a circle um, and then you would have a, a little inner circle, those people that are in the inner circle are the ones he's talking about. He's not talking about the whole world. As many of you, these are the ones he's talking about, the sons of God, faith in Christ Jesus, through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ, um, induces thy is the infinitive, and that means to clothe yourself with something. So they translate as put on. And in, in a sense, if I'm putting on my clothes, it, yeah, I mean, that's okay. We have to see this is talking about clothing. So let's look at this, um, the rendering of that. In duo is the uh, basic plain vanilla form. Um, like I said, induces thy would be the infinitive where it's a, you know, I'm, I have to clothe, you know, myself or whatever. Um, so here, yeah. So um, here's one variant of the form. Uh, you will put on or you clothe yourself. Um, here, he was dressed in a wedding garment. Um, here's a, a, a participle form of it in the uh, uh, perfect case, uh, perfect perfect tense. Um, here's a form. These are all various forms of the same verb. And you can just see, uh, you were talking about clothing here. Uh, John the Baptist was clothed with camel's hair, same verb. 
So this is all talking about being clothed. He was clothed in these garments in Mark. Talking about John the Baptist again. Um, that's what this is. It's all about being clothed. Here, clothed with power. So in duo, you know, which is the plain vanilla form of the verb, which is present tense, indicative mood, active voice, is the way that is, verbs are always presented in the lexicon. Um, so this verb is all about putting on our clothing. Um, so if I put on my clothes, that's in the sense of put on we're talking about. It's not the same verb as, you know, like teeth me would be like I put something on a table. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about clothing. And so that's what Paul is saying. For as many of you who are clothed with Christ, you know, you are sons of God. You're the one sons of God through faith by being justified by faith. Okay. And then you could go on from there. Read that if you want. We're going to move on here. Um, Romans 6, like I mentioned before, I'm really wanting to jump into this here, but I want to show you first. The first six verses, he just got done talking about chapter 5, you know, basically contrasting the first Adam, which led us into death. The second Adam lead, leads us into life. He does it in chapter 5. And he says, you know, first it was by the law, like we just saw in Galatians. The law was a tutor bringing us to Christ, pointing us to Christ. There's all these prophecies in the law pointing to Christ. And so they bring us to Christ. And so... The second Adam um, saves us through grace. That's what he's saying. So since we're saved by grace, should we continue in sin? Certainly not. Absolutely not. So this is, you know, like meganoito means like, don't let it happen. How shall we who died to sin live any longer? So, it's, you know, people there are saying, well, you know, as Christians, we're still living in sin. <laughs> no. Why don't you believe the scripture? No. No. And, you know, we could get into more scriptures, but this video is not about that. Or do you not know there's many of us who are baptized into Christ? There's that same phraseology again we had in Galatians. He says, as many of you, you know, you're all sons of God. Who? As many of you who are baptized into Christ, close yourself with Christ. Right here, he says, many of you um, right here who are baptized into Christ Jesus are baptized into his death. So we've clothed ourselves with Christ by clothing ourselves with death. Therefore, we were buried with him. Uh, through baptism into death. See, that's how we escape. When you get to Romans chapter 8, if you keep reading from chapter 6, 7, and 8, he starts calling it the law of sin and death. So the law of sin and death is you sin, you die. That's what we got in chapter right here in verse 15. What shall we say then? Um, actually, let me skip down. Uh, verse 16. Do you not know um, to whom you present yourself, slaves to obey? You are that one, slaves whom you obey. Whether you obey sin leading to death obedience to righteousness so right here sin leading to death if you obey sin it leads to death right and that's what he says down here verse 23 the wages of sin is death if you obey sin you die so this is the thing um that you have to understand is we all sinned that's what romans or chapter 5 you know verse 12 said all have sinned or romans chapter 3 verse 23 all have sinned and fall short of the glory of god and you know romans chapter 5 verse 12 says we all die because we all sin right so we have to die both like physically we have to die and then jesus is going to resurrect us because the whole new testament says the promise for christians is the resurrection and that's a whole nother video too um it's not that we go directly to heaven after we die and stuff so let's not get into that here um but anyway the, the hope is resurrection and that's what this is talking about for if we have been united together with him in the similarity or likeness of his death and we do that by faith Certainly, we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection because he's going to resurrect us. John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29 says, All who are in their graves will hear the voice of the Son of Man and come out. Those who have done what is good because they repented, like, like Isaiah prophesied, you know, cease to do evil. That's what he says here. Do, should we continue in sin? Absolutely not. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. And then in Ezekiel, he says, I myself will teach my people. Jesus came. It's God in the flesh. He came to teach us how to stop living in unrighteousness and start clothing ourselves with righteousness. So he teaches us. So first it starts out by him sprinkling his righteous blood on us and he cleanses us and washes our sins away. And this happens by the ordinance that God established, which is by participating in his death. And that happens through water. Fire destroys, water saves. We die with Christ by faith this way so if we've been united together with him in the likeness of his death certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old man was crucified with him jesus said unless you unless you take up your cross daily so it starts here but it's daily and then second timothy chapter 2 verse 11 if we die with him then we shall also live with him 
right here starts with this. We've got to die with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Let that sink in. For he who has died has been justified from sin. Now, in one sense, you zoom out and go, yeah, it does mean being set free. But that's not what the word uh, means. Let's take a look. Let's see. So Romans chapter 6, uh, verse 7. Let's see what the word is in Greek, and let's go check it out. Um, okay, yeah, Hina. Okay, so so that the body of sin is no longer enslaved, uh, enslaved us to sin. Um uh, because Hogar Apothanon, Pothanon, the one, the one having died, Ho Pothanon, the one having died, um, has been justified from sin. Okay, so let me show you. They decayotai. They um, decayotai. So let's go look at that. They decayo, or decayo, sorry. The present tense, indicative. Uh, mood active voice is always the lexical form um so let me show you up here real quick dko uh make righteous def uh defend the cause justify yeah worry about that so much this is a really um pet word for protestants so since a lot of them do the lexicons and stuff i want you to see the verses so you can see how they're used it's constantly used as justify in one sense, vindication is a little bit of an idea of justify. Jesus used it in Luke 7. Here's the gospel. She's using the word. It's justified, justified, justified. Um, Acts chapter 13, uh, King James, justified. Um, you know, in one sense, it means freed. But since we're using the same word, we have to stick with the same word so we can see the continuity in Romans. It's constantly. Romans chapter 2 is the first time he uses it. Um, of the law is justified right here, dikaio. Uh, uh, and then it's a future form, uh, passive. Anyway, uh, so just constantly using the same word, justified, 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 justifier. You know, here's as a participle, somebody that is justifying. Uh, justified. So this is all Romans 3. So notice this is the word that you're that you're used to seeing. Say, hey, we're justified by faith. Right here, Romans, the same letter that Paul writes. And then in chapter 6, he unpacks that. Now look here what he says. This is the word, Right. For he who has died, this is the perfect form, R means perfect, um, has been justified from sin. Apo means away from sin. And so that's what it means, justified. So hopefully you can see that. Um, I encourage you to go check that out more if you're not uh, convinced. Um, certainly you can go look this link up and investigate it further. But it's really a, a pet word for Protestant theology. It started with Martin Luther. And sometimes, I don't know, I don't want to accuse anybody, but sometimes they're just like not honest, man. They need to be consistent. So if you can see it in Romans 6 right here, for he who has died has been justified from sin. Then when you go to chapter 3, and, you, you know, like we just saw in Galatians, um, let me go to 3, and you can see... Uh, Uh, okay, but now righteousness of God, apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, righteousness through faith in Jesus to all who believe, and for all of sin and fall short of the glory, being justified, and now they put the word freely in there, it's 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 not in the Greek, by his grace, we'll be justified by his grace through redemption. What's his grace? Titus 2.11, grace has appeared, it offers salvation to all people, it's Jesus. And it's training us to say no to ungodliness. Jesus came to make disciples. And that's what the word literally means, you know, training. I mean, they say teaching. I don't really have a big problem with that. But it's, you know, the word really means um, training. And a variant of that word in, as a noun means like uh, a child, you know. So it's somebody that's like training a child or whatever. Um, but anyway, so th that's the idea is Titus 2.11 is saying that grace has appeared, offering salvation to all people. That's Christ. Um, he trains us to say no to ungodliness and worldly desires and live righteous lives, self-controlled and godly or pious in this in this life, waiting for the return of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so that grace has appeared. So the grace is not just this, you know, it, in fact, it doesn't even I, I can't prove that here because I don't have time, but it doesn't mean unmerited favor. It means favor. In fact, I could take you back to where we were in, in uh, Romans chapter six. And then show you in Greek that here in uh, verse, 
uh, 17, but God be thanked, this word right here is caris, which same word that they translate as grace, caris. Um, so I can show you real quick, verse 17. Uh, let's see. Okay, caris de toteo. And so you can go look that up if you want, but I'll just show you uh, other occurrences of that on this page. Caris, right here. Caris, right here in the beginning. So since we're, um, shall, you know, since what should we say then? Shall we continue to sin so that caris may abound? Um, and I'll show you another one. Yeah, right here. So here's the accusative form, same word. Um, you're not in the law, but under grace, caris. Um, and then here, when you get down here, now when they're pointing us to God, they go, oh, we don't say grace to God because we want everybody to think it means unmerited favor. So we'll say thanks, right? And so a variant of that form, Eucharist, Eucharisto, no, Eucharista, Eucharistia, I think. But um, but there's a verb form, which I started to say of it. But in any case, that's translated as, you know, Thanksgiving. And, you know, Eu means good or well. And then Caris, which is the same root in there, um, you know, it's kind of the idea of Thanksgiving. And, you know, it's kind of used in the idea of, you know, the Eucharist or communion. That's what Jesus said when he was having the first communion with his disciples before he went to the cross. And so, um, so that, yeah, so it's the same word, caris. So we're saved by that, which is Christ. So everything that he does, his sprinkled blood, his sacrifice, everything. He's training us to, you know, like we said in Titus 2.11, you know, that, that grace has appeared and he trains us. And so, um, so as I was showing you, if we die with him, you know, if we die with him in baptism, it's this death. Whoever right here, for whoever has died has been justified from sin. So I just showed you that. Feel free to go look that up here, um, you know, in Bible Hub. You can look at the link there and uh, go look that up. Um, because the one that, is, um, that has died um, has been justified from sin. And they love to hide it. They cover it up, you know, by saying freed so people can't see. That this is what Romans chapter 3 is talking about. This is what Galatians is talking about when it says, you know, that we're justified by faith. Yeah, we're just by faith by whoever has died, has been set free from sin, um, or has been justified, sorry, has been justified by sin. So by faith, we die with Christ, and that justifies us. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so now look at Colossians. So here in Genesis chapter 17, I'm not going to go there. Genesis chapter 17, you go look it up. You see where God for the first time commands circumcision. So that's fleshly circumcision. The first couple chapters of Galatians is talking about that. It shows Paul rebuking Cephas because he was like, you know, shrinking back from, you know, circumcised versus uncircumcised, which is basically the Jews that are circumcised versus the uncircumcised Gentiles. And they're all Christians and you're like separating. He rebukes him. So it starts out talking about flesh in that sense. And then he transitions as he moves, explaining all this stuff, prefiguring the, the foreshadowing allegories and prophecy in the Old Testament in this regard, that that flesh and the cutting away of that flesh is the same thing that Paul is preaching in many of his letters where he talks about crucifying the flesh, uh, put the flesh to death and don't walk with the desires of the flesh. And then you move through the same letter in Galatians that we're talking about from where he's talking about flesh being cut away through circumcision, that where it transitions to chapter 5 and starts talking about being set free through Christ, through repentance. And repentance is the idea of you crucifying the desires of the flesh. And so that's why you see in Galatians chapter 5 where he says, uh, we can go there real quick, uh, Galatians chapter 5, uh, towards the end there, he starts explaining about putting the flesh to death. And this is a picture of repentance. So this is why repentance and baptism together are so important. Going all the way back to Isaiah. Let me remind you again. Wash yourself. Make yourself clean. Put away the evil doings from my eyes. Cease to do evil and learn to do good. That's repentance. This is baptism. This is how the early Christians understood. This is the sprinkling of blood of Christ. Sanctifying, justifying us as we die with him. And he says he's going to do that for us. Um, it's a prophecy in, the, in Isaiah. So Anyway, so getting into it here, where we at? Galatians chapter 5. So starting like here, he's transitioning, he's explaining all this stuff. And then just, you know, when you start getting down this area here, um, this I say that the law, which, uh, and let me scroll down a little more. Um, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I'm still in Galatians 3. I thought I... Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this is where I want to be. Um, so I say then, walk in the Spirit, or walk by the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the, the epithumias, the intemperate passions. You know, that's what has to be cut away. And so I've done other videos on those. I encourage you to just, you know, look through my channel where I start talking about the lust or the flesh versus the spirit. Look for, I don't even remember what the title is, but I explain it thoroughly. Romans chapter 8, Galatians 5, I, I show that this is fundamental to a teaching that Paul is teaching. I show where Peter brings it out in 1 Peter chapter 4, uh, other passages. Um, look at those videos. Look at that. But epithumia, it's this idea that even in Romans chapter 7, verse 5, they translate as covetousness. I explain in the videos why that they do that because of the Hebrew and versus the Greek Old Testament, which actually it's a quote. Paul is quoting Romans chapter 7 from the Greek Old Testament. It's a word for word. It's identical. And that it's not covetousness. It's the same word. It's lust. It's the word that Jesus uses in Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 27 through 30, where he's talking about if a man lusts, he's committing adultery. Epithumia is what that is. So um, he says here, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the epithumia of the flesh, that lust or that that passion. And then he shows here that the um, that whole idea is what all this sin results from, and that's what he's saying. the the flesh uh, The flesh lusts or epithumia. Now it's using it as a verb against the spirit and the spirit contrary or against the flesh. They're in opposition to each other. That's what Jesus says the night that he's going to the cross and he's in the Garden of Gethsemane with his apostles. He said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, and these two are contrary to each other. And so the way to overcome these sins is by crucifying the flesh. And so this is repentance daily. Jesus, take up your cross. That's what he says, or you cannot be my disciple. And if, we, if we're not his disciples, we're, we're not going to be saved. We can't be saved. So anyway, um, so this is, this is the idea of repentance. And then here, if you walk with the Spirit, this is the sorts of, of godly virtues that result. Um, love, joy, peace. You know, patience, which is long suffering, uh, synonym for each other. Uh, kindness. Now, this word here is a variant of the word that is what Jesus is talking about, my yoke. Um, and they translate it as easy. And I've talked about that in other videos. Christos does not mean easy, it means being useful. With, you know, if you bundle together these words kindness, usefulness to your neighbor, um, probably benevolence, I mean, those together, that's what that means. That's the yoke that Jesus says he will make you by being disciples and learning from him. And he says that, you know, my yoke is that and my uh, burden, you know, is light. So, but that's, that's a variant of this word here. They translate it as kindness. And so it's that yoke and then virtue or goodness. Virtue, I think is a better word. Um, I think goodness is really trampled by Protestant theology and makes it sound like it's almost evil and stuff. Um, this is really important to God, this whole idea of goodness and virtue and loving your neighbor as yourself. That's what fulfills the law, loving God with everything you got and love your neighbor as yourself. And if we become students of Jesus, we will do that. If we do it just by trying to follow our own ideas and like, oh, yeah, I'm a good person, whatever, but I'm saved or whatever, you, you're not going to do it. You got to learn from Jesus. Obey the Sermon on the Mount. That's going to train you in these virtues and stuff. And so we crucify the flesh. We learn from Jesus. We obey what he teaches. And all these fruits result. You know, we have the Spirit of Christ. Uh, faithfulness. Uh, if you have faith, you can't have faith if you're not faithful. So uh, gentleness, uh, which we said, praus. That's what Jesus said. The praus or the gentleness, you know, or the gentle will inherit the earth. Um, and self-control. Self-control is the virtue that tramples the flesh, that crucifies it. And so um, Acts chapter uh, 24, verse 24, um, it shows there that where Paul was preaching uh, faith in Christ Jesus. And then verse 25, he summarizes what he unpacks that. What does that look like? Righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. And why, why, why does he say the judgment to come? Because these two things, righteousness and then so you're, crucifying all the things that are bad, like all these things through trampling the flesh. And you're learning to do all the things that are good. And that's what Isaiah prophesied. Learn to do good. Cease to do evil. And so righteousness is learning to do good and then not doing evil. And then cease and do evil, um, you know, self-control. 
does that. And that's that's the idea of repentance that prepares us for the um, for the judgment to come and stuff. So don't let people lie to you and say, oh, that's work salvation, whatever. It's 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 so demonic. It's like it, it makes God out to be like he doesn't care about what is good. And, you know, the reason why God put light and darkness in the world and, and other pairs that are as opposite to each other as, as possible in nature is because God and who is he about and who his people are about through Christ are as opposite as how they were before and how darkness and evil and Satan and all that stuff, whatever. They're not still like, you know, kind of like Satan, maybe a little bit better, but hey, they're forgiven. And it's, it's just wicked modern teaching that has polluted Christianity. And if you'll be fervent with the scriptures, you can escape the lies. You don't even need to learn Greek. You don't even have to watch my videos. Just take really seriously what the scriptures ta um, teach. But see, people don't. It, they're so blinded with their false theology. They need someone to come along, like with the Ethiopian eunuch in the chariot where Philip asked him. He says, do you understand what you're reading? What does, eunuch say? what does the eunuch say? He says, how can I unless somebody explains it to me? And so God sends people to go and help somebody. And then once they get the blinders off their eye, now they're to go and, and help somebody else or whatever. So we are our brother's keeper and stuff. So anyway, um, get into Colossians here. The analogy of the repentance, which is cutting away the, the foreskin, the, the picture of that prophecy of of circumcision is spiritual circumcision. And so um, let me uh, show real quick Romans chapter 2 just to show you what we're talking about Colossians. Get rid of the Greek there. All right. So if we scroll down to the bottom here, um, he starts talking about circumcision. You started talking about contrasting, you know, Jews versus Gentiles, and he's talking about who's the real Jews, who's the real descendants of Abraham. Um, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you're a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become as if it's uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised person or man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not this physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you? Who, even with your written code, because he's talking to Jews here, he says right here, if you're a Jew and you rest on the law and you make your boast and you know and you claim to know the law, that's who he's talking to. And will not the physically uncircumcised the Gentile, um, if he fulfills the law, judge you, even though with your written code, your Mosaic law, circumcision, are a transgressor of the law. You don't even keep what Moses says. Um, but you're like, hey, I'm circumcised and I keep the Sabbath. That's what matters. That's how the Pharisees were. Um, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly by circumcision, nor circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, like what was established in Genesis chapter 17 with um, with Abraham, but fulfilled through Christ. And we're going to look at that in Colossians chapter 2 in a second. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of that of the heart, prophesied by Jeremiah, Isaiah, the prophets. Circumcision of the heart. Even Moses told the people to be circumcised in the heart, not just outwardly. In the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. So it's circumcision of the heart. So let's take a look at that. Um, so Paul, the same guy who wrote this letter, he starts talking about that here. Um, so he says here, um, where should I start to give it some context? Uh, so he's talking about Christ. Who is he? And he says, in him dwells all the fullness of the deity, uh, divinity. Um, let's see, it's a variant of the word theos, which means God. And it's, uh, I think it's still a noun. Uh, but it's a variant, and it's better translated as divinity because Godhead kind of gets all kinds of misunderstandings and stuff, but it's divinity bodily. So it's the word that became flesh. That's Christ. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power um, or authority, actually. And in him you were also circumcised or circumcision made without hands uh, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So this is circum this is repentance right here. This is what we're talking about, cutting away those fleshly desires. This is the flesh that's being cut away, buried with him in baptism, in which you also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And remember, in Romans chapter 6, we saw whoever has died has been justified from sin. So that's what we're talking about, him. Having been buried with him in baptism, um, who was raised with him through your faith in the power of God, and the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and uncircumcised of your flesh prior to baptism, he has made alive together with Christ by dying with him, right? 
having forgiven you all your trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that were that stood against us, because this all happened right here by dying with Christ. Like we said, at Romans chapter 6, verse 7, whoever has died, because we die with Christ, the first six verses of Romans, uh, we, whoever has died has been justified from sin, and it's by faith, by dying with Christ. Um, right here, um, having wiped out the requirements, handwriting the requirements that, that were against us, stood against us, which were contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed the principalities and the authorities and the powers. He has made a public spectacle of them. That's what he did on the cross against Satan and the kingdom of darkness, triumphing over them in it, right? And so then he goes on and starts talking about the law and stuff. We're not going to get into that. But just this idea of we die through circumcision, we crucify, we cut away the fleshly desires. And that was the idea we saw in Galatians chapter 5. You stop walking with the flesh and we start walking with the spirit. And that's what repentance is all about. That's what cutting away the circumcision is uh, that was foreshadowed through uh, Abraham, through Moses. That's what that was pointing to. And so now another angle of looking at uh, baptism. Had meaning with Christ, circumcision, circumcised our hearts with the knife made of the rock, who is Christ, because Christ is the rock. Um, I'll show that in a second. Um, many of you may not know that the book of Joshua is a transliterated word, like we have many words. Um, uh, like, for instance, uh, I'll just tell you the word that we translate, um, you want, or see, uh, what is the word? Uh, that we translate in the Old Testament because it comes from Hebrew as Jacob. Um, but in the New Testament, that very same name in the Greek Old Testament, they translate it as James for some reason. I don't know why they do that. And similarly, because of Yeshua in the Old Testament, which is the book of Yeshua, it comes right after Deuteronomy, they translate that as Joshua, right? But Yeshua brought into Greek is Jesus, and Jesus brought into English is Jesus. So the book after Moses' Torah, you know, that follows Joshua or Yeshua is actually the book of Jesus in Greek or Jesus. And so um, so we see in the book of Joshua, and I could go there, I'll go there in a second, um, that God had Yeshua or, you know, Jesus, um, the son of Nun, uh, the successor of Moses, to make, to, to circumcise the men with the, with the knife made out of a rock. And then the early Christians talked about that. That rock is Christ. Uh, Christ is the rock. And he said, on this rock, I will build my church. And in one sense, yeah, okay, that's Peter. In another sense, you know, Jesus referred to as the rock. Um, but Romans chapter 2, circumcision of the heart. Uh, we looked at that. Um, by the Spirit makes one a Jew, descendant of Abraham, to share in his inheritance. And then Romans chapter 6, we looked at it when we die with Jesus um, in order to live. Because, you know, like it says, verse 7 um, whoever has died has been set free from sin. Um, and in Galatians 3, we looked at it. We clothe ourselves with Jesus by, by dying with him in baptism. Uh, we clothe ourselves with Christ. So here, another angle would be looking at what Peter's talking about. So in Acts chapter 2, if you go and look at this, if you haven't seen this before, all this prophecy up here that he's going over shows that Roman, or Psalms chapter 16 shows that he went down into Hades, right in this area right here. He went down into Hades, and then he arose. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry. This is Acts chapter 3. Let me go back. So we look at this prophecy. Um, he starts quoting this prophecy. Your holy one will not see decay or corruption. He's talking about his body. Um, but his soul would not be left in Hades. So body and soul um, you know, would go down, dip down into Hades on the third day. And this is how the early Christians understood this. And so this is what Peter's talking about right here. When he starts talking about Christ also suffered once for sins, verse 18, 1 Peter chapter 3, um, the righteous for the unrighteous or the just for the unjust. Because like we said, that dikaios is a adjective or dikaio is a verb. Um, just, justified, justifier, righteous. You know, it's, a, it's the same word and they kind of diverge it in English and it confuses people. Um, but just uh, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Uh, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So here's that contrast between flesh and spirit again. Uh, put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So this is the idea of the circumcision. Uh, put to death in the flesh, um, made alive in the spirit. By whom also he went and preached the spirits in prison. That's what Jesus went down into Hades. That's how the early church understood it. Who formerly were disobedient, those, those spirits down there in those prisons. Um, when once the divine long-suffering... Um, 
you know, or patience, waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being built, being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, so Noah and his family, were saved through water. And now it shows down here, we're going to look at verse 21, that we're saved through water. And that's the contrast he's talking about. They were saved through water. There is now an antitype, which now saves us. Baptism, saving us. This antitype. So baptism saves us, and the water is the antitype. That's what it's saying. Not the removal of the uh, filth of the flesh, but the answer of, it doesn't mean a con good conscience. It actually means, or I'm sorry, right here, answer. It doesn't mean answer. It means actually the opposite of answer, which is asking. So um, it's epi, it's the epi ero, erotao. So it's the verb that means to like, you know, ask emphatically, or I would say beg. So it's begging God for a clear conscience. I don't know why they say answer. I guess it's because of theology or something. But it's a begging God for a clear conscience. So how does that happen? It's the sprinkling blood of Jesus. He sprinkles his blood on our souls and we get cleansed. So this is what Acts chapter 22, verse 16, when Ananias says to Saul, what are you waiting for? Get up, washing your, you know, be baptized, washing your sins away, calling on his name. And so, um, you know, and that's even what we saw in Acts chapter 2, if you remember. I'm sorry, Acts chapter 3, when we said ex alifo, where they translated it as, you know, uh, repent, you know, having uh, your your sins um, uh, conver or being converted and having your sins um, blotted out. It actually means anointed out, and that's anointed with the blood of Jesus. And that's what we said, First John chapter 5, verse 7, these three are one, water, blood, and spirit. So water and spirit is Acts chapter 2. Repent, be baptized, water. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the uh, what happens invisibly is on our souls. Um, when we repent, we beseech God for a, for a clear conscience. He cleanses us with the blood of Christ and washes our, our, our souls, which cleanses us. So that now, having become justified and, and sanctified, become holy, our souls are cleansed. That's why we feel differently. Uh, assuming we were really repented and that, you know, we're really baptized, you know, not just taking a bath. Um so, and that's what happens. We're washed outwardly. We're, we're washed inwardly with the blood of Jesus, outwardly by water, um, and sanctified, purified. And so, you know, Irenaeus explained the reason why Jesus had to fulfill all righteousness with John the Baptist to be baptized is he purified the water on this planet so that we can be baptized. So that we, through Christ, here's the God-man purifying the water so that we can not just take a normal bath, but by faith. If we do that, now that water becomes salvific. And so uh, um, so that's what we're talking about here. And this is how Galatians 3 says we clothe ourselves with Christ because Christ did something special to the water. And it's not a coincidence that the one that God, Jesus, who died for us, that designed the, the rain cycle so that the water evaporates and, and just circulates throughout the whole planet. This is, this is my perspective. It's not a coincidence that the water is always constantly united with each other through these rain cycles or whatever after Jesus was, was uh, baptized. And it just totally circulates and just stirs throughout the earth and making the water salvific for all human beings and stuff. So by faith, by dying with him and stuff. So let's continue on. Um, I think we thoroughly went over this, right? First uh, Peter 3. Um, you can look at that some more if you like. And so this is, uh, I just want to show what Jesus said when he talked to the Nicodemus. He said, most surely I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit. Again, 1 John 3, uh, 5 verse 7, water, blood, and spirit. So he says, unless you're born of water and the spirit, he's basically saying, you will not get my blood. You will not inherit the kingdom of God. You will not, you cannot see the, the kingdom of God. Um, so that's what we're talking about. Water and spirit by faith, we receive the blood of Christ. And so that's what Jesus is saying. That's how the early church understood it. It's a very childlike understanding. We don't have to make theology out of it and say, no, no, you know, it's just by Jesus alone. Well, you're blinding yourself. If you don't believe what the scriptures say, you're not really, I mean, and so let's look at what Jesus said. Matthew 28, uh, 18, 19. And Jesus came and spoke to them. This is fulfillment of prophecy. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. If you look at Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, where it says the Son of Man was brought before the Ancient of Days, and a kingdom was given him so that all peoples, tribes, and nations and languages would serve and obey him. And um, so that's a fulfillment of prophecy. Even Psalms 2, verse 8, uh, verse 7 says, you know, Yahweh says to me, you are my son, today I've begotten you. Ask me, verse 8, ask me and I will give the nations your inheritance 
the ends of the earth is your possession. And so this is what we're talking about. All authority, authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, the disciples. So you're going to make disciples um, in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. This is what it means to be baptized in the name of Christ. Because in the name of is an idiomatic phrase that means in the authority of, in, in the uh, instructions, in the authority of, of the one who says it. In the name of in the name of Christ is okay. This is what he said in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's how the early church understood it. And then this is super important. Teach them to observe or to keep actually. Um te um tereso or tereo. Um but anyway, it just means to keep, to hold on to, to maintain, to protect um all things that I've commanded you. So it's basically saying teach them to keep and to do and to Hold on to and to persevere to the end. Mark 13, verse 13. Jesus said, he that perseveres to the end will be saved. That's a picture of getting inside the Passover lamb. If you look at Exodus chapter 12, where the Passover was established, and then the death angel swept over Egypt and killed all the firstborn and stuff. And the way that you escape that is the blood on the wood, on the house, you know, the pure lamb sacrifice. That's the picture of the cross. You get in there. That's a, get, you know, getting in the house. That's a picture of getting into Christ. And the way you get into him is through what we've just talked about and stuff. So, And you stay there by obeying him. And that's what he says in John 15, verse 9 and 10, um, that I will remain in you if you remain in me. So how will I remain in you? Well, it's the spirit of Christ. We said that Romans 8, verse 9 and 10. Whoever doesn't have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So he will give us his spirit if we obey him. And that's what I'm going to show you one last passage. Um, I need to end this video. This is a really long video. Um so yeah, Acts chapter, yeah, let's see. Um, Acts chapter three, what was I going to show you? Oh, I'm sorry, uh, chapter five actually. So it's Acts chapter five, verse 32. Remember this passage, super important passage. Acts chapter five, verse uh, 32. Okay, right here, verse 32. And we are his dis witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to whom? To those who obey him, right? Hebrews 5, or excuse me, yeah, Hebrews 5, Hebrews 5, verse 8 and 9. It says that Christ became the uh, source of eternal salvation to those that obey him. So that's what he's talking about here. And teach them to obey and keep everything that I've commanded you. Observe everything I've commanded you and keep. And Jesus said, like I said, John 15, verse 9 and 10, remain in me and I'll remain in you. If you continue to obey my commandments, I will remain in you and you will remain in me kind of thing. So take a look at that. So anyway, that's the end. I think we can safely stop this video. I bless you. Okay, God bless you.